Good morning. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you here today. It is great to see each and every one of you on a beautiful day God has given to us to gather in his house, to worship him, to celebrate our salvation together. Again, a very warm welcome to all of you. I want to read just a couple of verses from Psalm 149 as we enter into our time of worship today. The psalmist writes these words, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in their maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Now I hear those verses and there's a common theme that I, that I hear very clearly coming out is that we're to be joyful as we gather for worship. Joyful as we gather in the presence of our God. And so that's how we want to worship today. And as we enter into that worship, with that kind of joy ringing in our hearts, God wants to greet his people. Would you please stand to receive that greeting today? Well, congregation, God greets us this morning with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Well, let's put that joy into action today. Let's sing together, Resurrecting. The resurrected 
pray with me. God, we are so thankful for this new day you've given to us. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to start this new week here in your house, in your presence, singing your praises because it's good and right and fitting for us to do so. We're your people, not because of anything we've done, but because of what you have done for us, because by your grace you have called us to be your own to love you, to serve you, to be a shining light in the world around us. So, Father, we pray that you would use this time to help us to glorify you, to help us to lift up your name, to be encouraged to go from this place into this week you have planned for us, to live for you with all that we are. So, God, we give this time to you, we give ourselves to you, and we do so only and always in the beautiful, wonderful, and powerful name of Jesus, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. We're going to sing another song right now. It's a song we've recently learned. What a beautiful name. And as we sing, just pay really close attention to the words. Offer it as a praise to Jesus himself. Let's remain seated as we sing. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're hidden. Thank you. 
Now, the focus of our faith, and I think we know this very well, is Jesus Christ himself. It's Jesus because of his person and his work. God's grace incarnate. That's why we're here today. We'd like to think about that in a statement of faith in just a moment, the Apostles' Creed. But I'd like us to think about faith for just a moment. I want to read a couple of questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism. First of all, question and answer 21, where it asks, what is true faith? And the answer, true faith is not only a knowledge and conviction that everything God reveals in his word is true, but it's also a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us by Christ, not only others, but I too, have had my sins forgiven, have been made forever right with God, and have been granted salvation. And question and answer 22, what then must a Christian believe? Everything God promises us in the gospel. That gospel is summarized for us in the articles of our Christian faith, a creed beyond doubt, and confessed throughout the world. And even as these words are being confessed and celebrated throughout the world today, we want to join our voices in that and say together the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as we say these words in unison together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's respond and let's sing, I will sing of my Redeemer.
may be seated. Let's go together to our God in a time of prayer. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, certainly with praise in our heart and with praise on our lips. We praise you because you are our great and glorious God, and you are the God of our salvation. You are the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yours truly is the name that is above every other name. And God, we thank you for this marvelous gift of faith that you have given to us. Not only this head knowledge that you have planted within us, but that heart knowledge as well. And that this is a gift of your Holy Spirit that you have brought us into your family, that you have called us your sons and your daughters, and that solely by your grace. We are so very thankful for that. We praise you for that. And we ask that we'd be able to do that not only here in this time of worship as we sing and celebrate before you, but in our everyday lives as well. Every moment of every second that you give to us, that we live our lives in praise and honor and glory to you. Father, we are so thankful for your faithfulness in our lives. It's a faithfulness that we experience uh, even or perhaps especially in times of of our unfaithfulness. But God, you remain faithful to us no matter what. And Father, you remind us that nothing can ever separate us from you. That once you call us to be your children, we are yours forever. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for the times when we falter, when we fail, for that sin that is in our lives as we continue to strive to put off the old self and take on the new self. That you remind us, God, that we don't try to do this in our own strength, but you give to us your spirit. Father, we thank you for the many blessings you've given to us. We think of the blessings you've showered down upon us as a, a church family with the, the many babies that have been born lately. We thank you for Garrett and Kyler and Imrickson and Madeline and Hattie. We know there are more to come. Father, we're grateful for that. We pray that you be with these little ones and be with all of our children, be with all of our young people, Lord. We thank you for each and every one. They are precious to you and they are precious to us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to start some of our fall programming in the very near future. Father, we pray that as gems and cadets in our youth ministry and various Bible studies begin to meet, and Father, we pray that you would use these to grow our faith, and, and Father, that we would grow in the, the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we recognize that not only is your hand upon us as a, a congregation, that your hand continues to be on your church throughout this nation and even throughout this world, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they are. And Father, we know it's been a challenging season for your church as of late, particularly over the past six months. And so, Father, we pray for your church. We claim the promise in your word that not even the gates of hell will be able to, to stand against your church. And Father, we know that. And Father, we pray that you continue to bless us as a as a church across the world, that you would help us to continue to be the light and salt that, that you want us to be. May we be that right here in, in the village of Grafskop in the city of Holland. Father, we do pray for our world today, for the many tensions and struggles around the globe. We pray for our nation. We pray for the upcoming presidential election and other elections alongside of that. We continue to pray for all of those whom you've put in positions of leadership. We pray, too, for the areas in our nation that are battling fires. We've heard so much about the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, 
but further uh, east even than that, and we pray for those who are fighting those fires. We pray for those who are in the path of those fires and those who've experienced devastation because of those fires. Father, we pray that you would provide, that you would grant safety to those who battle, and Father, we pray that very soon these fires would be able to be put out and lives would begin to begin to be pieced back together. We pray for our community. We pray for our farmers. Father, we're thankful for the sunshine and the rain that you have given. We recognize that the time of harvest is drawing near, and we pray for them. Father, we continue to pray for, for our church family. We think of those with special needs. We ask that you'll continue to be with Mark Brooker and Marsha Veltman and Alice Genzink and Jen Veal and Joanne Comparins and many in the nursing homes. And Father, we think of them in a special way again today as they've been so isolated the past number of months. And Father, as they can't see people face to face, that they would know the comfort of your presence uh, right next to them every moment of every day. We pray for those in our church family who are aging and feeling the effects of, of those years that ticking by. We pray you continue to encourage them and be with them. Again, we pray for our kids and our young people, especially as the many, so many of them have headed back to school and things are different. We pray that you would encourage them too. Be with uh, those family members and friends that need our prayers in a special way. We think of Linda Weemhoff again, and she battles this cancer, and it's invaded her life. And Father, we pray for, for your grace and your comfort, and if it be your will, your healing touch there too. Father, we know there's so much going on. There's so much going on in our individual lives and our family lives and our church lives and the lives of our, our nation, our world, our community. Father, we are so thankful that we don't have to shoulder that burden all by ourselves. But in fact, you invite us to, to come to you when we are weary and burdened and that you will give us that marvelous gift of rest. And so, Father, we do that now. And we thank you. And we do this always and only in Jesus' name and the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you, if you have uh, brought your Bible with you today, to go ahead and open those up and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think this is a, a passage that's going to sound familiar to, uh, to many of us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read that text for us a moment. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. The words will be on the screen behind me if you uh, don't happen to have a Bible with you this morning, but you've got one and it's a different translation, I don't think that's going to be a problem. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 
Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So as far as we want to read in God's word this morning, and may he bless his word to us today. Congregation, uh, a couple of Sundays ago, as uh, most of you are probably well aware of, we kind of brought to a close a series that we'd been involved with for much of the summer, uh, a series uh, called Lessons for Living. So hopefully you remember that. And in the course of that series, we talked about uh, various qualities, some key qualities that God wants to see in the hearts and lives of those who belong to him. And we kind of capped it off uh, by talking about the most fundamental quality of all, and that, of course, is love. Well, after that uh, series ended, I kind of thought, well, where are we going to go from here? What's, uh, what's our next uh, sermon series? What are we going to think about? What are we going to hear from God's Word? What do we want to learn together? And for one reason or the other, this theme of love just kept coming back to me. It just, uh, it, I couldn't shake it. And I think for good reason. I mean, after all, I think of everything that's going on in the world around us, and I think, is there anything that the world needs now more than love? And even when we think about uh, the things that are kind of happening uh, within our own nation, the turmoil in our own nation on, on a variety of different fronts, it seems to me that love is a pretty good theme for us to, to take some time and to really dig a little bit deeper into so this morning, uh, we are embarking on what I think is going to be a pretty exciting and at the very same time, pretty daunting expedition. In fact, one of the most exciting and daunting expeditions that we could ever take. Today, we're going to begin a journey to the top of what one person has labeled the Mount Everest of Love Writings, which of course is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Right? Really, no words get to the heart of what love is more than this chapter and no verses get to the heart of this chapter more than verses 4 through 8. So I want to take a moment and just read those verses once again. And I'm going to do so this time from the NIV. I think that uh, translation is a, a little more familiar to us when it comes to these very familiar passages. I, I, certainly that's true for me. So listen here again to what Paul writes in those few verses. Verses 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now I would imagine, you know, I, kind of stepping out a little bit, but I would imagine that these words aren't brand new to anyone here this morning, right? Even if you're not kind of a, a, a churchgoer on a regular basis, I still would say that these words are, are not completely unfamiliar to you. You've probably heard them somewhere. All of us have, maybe at a, a wedding ceremony, perhaps an anniversary celebration. Some of us might even have these words uh, printed on a, a plaque somewhere in our home. But so much more than just a popular poem, these words really lay out for us what loving others, what loving other people is really all about. Love in the real world. We're not talking about love in the abstract here. We're talking about love in the real world. We're talking about love in the trenches. We're talking about exactly the kind of love that Jesus told us about when he commanded us saying, love your neighbor as yourself. So in that respect, we want to spend the next several weeks digging into this love, or really just to keep our, our Mount Everest image going, or we're going to spend the next several weeks climbing up the north face of this love. And we want to come to understand everything we possibly can about the various aspects of this love, these descriptive words that Paul uses in those verses, and see how it is that we can foster this love more and more in our very lives. And we're going to do that all the while recognizing that in calling us to love, God is not asking us to manufacture this out of nothing. But in fact, God is inviting us 
to draw out of the infinite reservoir of His love, a love that He has deposited by His grace into our lives, into the lives of of we who are His people. He has given us His love. John writes this in 1 John 4 verse 19. We love because He first loved us. In other words, we have the capacity to love. We can love in this way because God has first poured this love into us. Now, there's a total of 10 characteristics of this love that we're going to be exploring uh, over the course of the next several weeks as we make our way to the summit. And as with every grand expedition, it starts with a single step, which is sometimes the most difficult step to take. And it's really no different here, right? As Paul puts it at the very beginning of his description, love is patient. Of all things, as one commentator put it, Paul presents patience as the premier expression of love. But what is patience, really? What is patience? I think most of us, if we just kind of asked that question randomly, we'd say something along the lines of, well, patience just means to wait, right? It's all about waiting. I ran across this uh, comic strip some time ago, uh, back in the Sunday funnies, you know, I don't even know if we still have those anymore, I don't get the paper, but, so ran across this comic strip some time ago, it's the Lockhorns, Uh, so there's Leroy, and if you don't know, the stars of this comic strip are uh, Leroy and Loretta Lockhorn, right? So here's Leroy, and he's in his doctor's office, and he says, I was in your waiting room for over an hour. Is that why I'm called patient? I mean, really, for most of us, when we think of patience, we, we think of this whole concept of waiting, right? Oh, whether it's in the grocery store, or uh, maybe it's in traffic somewhere, or you know, maybe it's on the golf course or in a hunting blind. It's just kind of waiting. And I think it's fair to say that waiting, uh, there's some part of patience that includes waiting, right? This capacity to wait is definitely a part of patience. But the patience that Paul is talking of here, the patience that is the premier expression of love, is so much more than that. Because when you, when you think about it, waiting right, is, is predominantly passive, right? Now, we, we might be twiddling our thumbs or something like that, but, but waiting is predominantly passive. But patience, the kind of patience that Paul is talking about here, it is predominantly proactive. In fact, patience is a choice that we make. So, the, the word, the Greek word that in our English translation is translated as patient. The Greek word is macrothumia. Now, I don't often throw Greek and Hebrew into sermons. That's really not kind of my style, but from time to time, it comes in pretty handy. So this is obviously an English kind of version of the Greek word macrothumia. This is the word that Paul uses in the text, and it's a combination word, right? It's two Greek words, macro meaning long, and thumia meaning temper. And so you put those two together, and what you have is long-tempered. Or as Max Lucado likes to describe it, taking a long time to boil. Okay? So in that respect, Max goes on to say, he says, think about a pot of boiling water. He says, what factors determine the speed at which it boils? The size of the stove? No. The pot? Well, the utensil may have an influence, but the primary factor is the intensity of the flame. Water boils quickly when the flame is high. It boils slowly when the flame is low. Patience keeps the burner down. And I love that description. I think it's just really, really helpful in understanding the patience that Paul is talking about in our text, that patience that is the premier expression of love, right? To to be a truly patient person, it's all about keeping the flame 
low. Now, that's not to say that a patient person just ignores misbehavior or or thinks somehow that sin and injustice is okay. No, absolutely not. Patience isn't naive. However, even in the midst of troubling circumstances, the patient person chooses to keep the burner down. And that's exactly where it connects with another descriptive phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when it says, love is not irritable. Love is not easily angered. You see, those two things really go together. This understanding of macrothumia and this understanding of love not being easily angered, they go together, right? The impatient person has a short fuse, right? She's very quick to fly off the handle. He's very quick to take offense. The patient person, however, isn't quick-tempered. The patient person chooses to keep his frustration on a low flame. And I think when we really begin to grasp this, when we really begin to understand it, then we understand why Paul, as led by the Holy Spirit, saw fit to put this word, to put patience, at the very front of his description of what love is really all about. Because when you think about it, patience has to come first. Before anything else, love is patient. I mean, that's really the way God relates to us, right? But before anything else in his love toward us, God is patient. He is macrothumia. I mean, just consider, consider for a moment what he's had to put up with, right, from the very beginning. Here he makes this this beautiful world, this very good world. He puts Adam and Eve in this beautiful garden, and what do they do? They disobey. Now, what does that disobedience bring? Well, now sin is ushered into the human experience. It distorts God's very good creation. People from that point on, as the book of Genesis tells us, they turn away from God Even his own people, his chosen people, they disregard him over and over and over again. And then finally, finally says, good, I'll send my own son. And what do they do? They nail Jesus to a cross like a common criminal. Over and over and over again, God chooses to be patient. Right, the psalmist puts it this way, right? He chooses to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And please understand, he didn't have to. He didn't have to. At any moment, God would have been perfectly in his right to explode. But he didn't. Instead, he chose to love, even to the point of sacrificing his very own son. That is patience. And, you know, since this is how God has treated us, this is how we're to treat others. This is how God has has treated us in the past. This is how he's going to treat us in the future. He continues to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, even when we falter and fail, because this is who he is. And because he has been patient with us, then we're called to be patient with others. Now, how do we do that? Right, that's really the million-dollar question, isn't it? How do we do that? Well, we do it primarily by remembering that this is how God has dealt and continues to deal with us. Do we deserve it? Absolutely not. What about others? Do they deserve our patience? What about that crazy driver on the road? You you know the one, right? The one who either weaves in and out of traffic or the one who likes to drive 25 and a 55 on a two-lane road? 
do they deserve our patience? What about unruly kids or obstinate coworkers or thoughtless neighbors or pushy salespeople or obnoxious telemarketers? What about people of a different political persuasion or outspoken proponents of something that we would understand to be diametrically opposed to the Christian worldview? Do they and countless others deserve our patience? No. But we give it to them anyway. Because that's what God gives to us. And you know what? We do it willingly. Even eagerly. That's what we do. Not because it's easy, but because it's the loving thing to do. And because that expression of love may just be that which paves the way for a heart to heal. Eli Vasil author of Night, the Pulitzer Prize winning account of the Holocaust, the eventual winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, he knows this very well. Back in 1954, a full decade before Night was published, he had an encounter with a man by the name of Francois Muriac, who was a, a devout Christian, and he had a knack of turning every conversation into a proclamation of Jesus that just infuriated Wiesel. Because, you see, Wiesel was still reeling from his, his experience in a German concentration camp and the apparent uh, apathy of, of believers. So at one point, Wiesel finally said, Sir, you speak of Christ. Christians love to speak of him. The passion of Christ, the agony of Christ, the death of Christ. In your religion, that's all you speak of. Well, I want you to know that 10 years ago, not very far from here, I knew Jewish children, every one of whom suffered a thousand times more, six million times more than Christ on the cross, and we don't speak of them. Can you understand that, sir? We don't speak of them. And at that, Vasil turned and walked away. Muriak was stunned, and he was deeply hurt. He had a choice to make. He could respond similarly in frustration and anger, but instead Muriak chose to be patient. And he gently pursued Vesel, and he invited him to share his story. And eventually, through that, Vasil put pen to paper, and a heart began to heal. That is the power of patience. And that is the patience that is the premier expression of love. I want to invite you, each one of you this week, to put that patience into practice. I can guarantee you, guarantee you, that you will have the opportunity to do so. Even this week, as I was thinking about this, this theme, this message, researching, writing, there were multiple opportunities that came my way, whether it was at, at home or at work or out on the road or in the grocery store. And I wish I could stand here and tell you that I rose to the occasion every time. But I can't. But I can tell you, even as author John Bloom said, when the opportunity comes, that moment will be our invitation to love. And as Bloom goes on to say, if we fail, we will not fear condemnation. The cross has already paid for that sin. We will just get up, 
Repent of our failure to God and to others. Rejoice in the grace of Jesus. And press on to grow in the grace of patient love. Would you pray with me? Father, today we pray in a special way that you would enlarge our desire to be Christians who truly love, who really love others, beginning with being patient with those around us, being macrothumia, long-tempered, to be those who keep the flame low and take a long time to boil. This is how you deal with us, as undeserving as we are. And this is how you want us to deal with others, as undeserving as they are. Help us to grow in the grace of patient love for your glory and for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song right now that I, I think many of us know. Lord, I want to be a Christian. But let's stand and let's sing a couple of these verses together. Lord, I want to be a Christian. For our closing song, we're going to sing the two verses of God, the Father of your people. And just a reminder, on your way out, uh, on your right, there'll be a couple of offering plates, and the offering uh, today is for uh, our operating fund right here at Grafskop. Before we sing together, God gives to us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the love of God the Father, and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.